You feel soil crunching underneath your sneakers. The suburbs feel like such a distant memory behind you now. The cool mist that hangs in the air caresses your skin tenderly. You're in the middle of a vast wheat field. You know that much. But the curtain of distant fog makes it almost impossible to see beyond that. It's a strange yet tranquil place. You feel so at ease here. For a moment, you entertain the thought that perhaps this place is heaven. Maybe you weren't such a waste of space after all, right? Welcome, explorer, to level 10. You fall to your knees, days of tiredness catching up to you all at once, like some tremendous cosmic punch. There's dirt on your hands and slacks now, but you don't mind it. In fact, its naturalness pleases you. You grab two handfuls of dirt and just squeeze, feeling the excess mud spool out from between your fingers. It's the most connected to the earth you've ever felt, in a metaphorical sense at least, because this is not the earth. As if perfectly timed to remind you of this, a great shape suddenly comes lumbering towards you out of the fog. Of course, your first instinct is a jolt of fear. Almost everything you've encountered in this place so far has wanted to destroy you, or worse. But when the creature comes into focus, a great, almost spherical, blob-like creature, you get the sense that this beast is docile, that it means you no harm. You calmly observe the strange creature from your place down in the dirt. Despite its size, its movements feel oddly graceful, as though it carries no actual weight. While you have no reason to know this creature's name, the humans who've traveled through here know it as a Gluff. And like most docile creatures, it isn't alone. Several more gluffs come trundling out of the mist, perhaps indicating herd behaviors. Unlike most entities in the back rooms whose favorite food is... One second, let me check my notes here. Oh, it's you. These gluffs are content to just graze on the wheat, which grows in abundance here on level 10. And in exchange for what they take, they give something truly wonderful. The gluffs secrete delicious, sweet almond water that's safe to drink and gathers in pockets around the field. You even take advantage of one of these yourself, as you decide to stand and venture further out into the field. There is an eerie emptiness to this place. You find stables filled with hay and horseshoes, but no horses. You find decrepit old farmhouses rotting from the eternal damp of the mist, with no sign of what you assume must have once been human habitation. Perhaps this whole place was more alive during a different time, but something must have changed that. You can't shake that strange, lingering aura of death, hiding just underneath the surface of everything you see. You happen upon a pocket of almond water left in the ground by a gluff, and take a long, satisfying swig. Immediately, you feel rejuvenated. The vigor returns to your body as if by magic. You stand again, feeling renewed, feeling ready to take on this level. You remember now, you're not just a survivor anymore. You are a fighter. You manage to outsmart and kill three different neighborhood watch creatures on the last level. Anything you encounter on this one better learn what it's dealing with quickly. You continue walking. You know well enough now that sometimes the best thing you can do in the back rooms is walk and hope, though at least your recent victories have bolstered your confidence a little. You pass more gluffs along the walk, minding their own business as you mind yours. You think to yourself, it's nice to encounter entities that seem to understand the concept of personal space, and they even have the courtesy to provide you with sweet, sweet almond water, too. Eventually, you see a different shape emerging from the distant mist. It's honestly the last thing you expect. What looks like a small cluster of stone towers built hundreds of years ago, like something straight out of the Middle Ages. Despite this, they're left standing tall. You've always been a little bit of a history enthusiast back on Earth. And let's be real here, a major high fantasy nerd, too. How many hours of playtime have you clocked on Skyrim again? <laughs> but hey, let's not get into that here. Perhaps against your better judgment, you know that you want to take a look inside these mysterious towers. So, what are you waiting for, explorer? You climb up until you find your way to an entrance. It's an old wooden door. You take a screwdriver out of your supplies and pry it open with a few good pushes. You really are getting the hang of all this, aren't you? You walk inside and begin ascending a grand spiraling staircase up towards the top of the tower. It is an impressive piece of architecture, far more extensive on the inside than you'd imagined. You decide to take a closer look at one of the many levels in the tower you're exploring, and you're impressed by what you see. 
The rooms are lit by great burning torches mounted on old metal sconces against the walls. The furniture here looks like a remarkably accurate museum recreation of a living area from the mid-1600s. Feeling impressed with the find, you briefly consider taking the weight off your feet and sleeping in the tower for the night, so that you can feel like a king for once in a world otherwise designed to make you feel so weak and small. However, this fantasy is interrupted by the obtrusive sound of a loud trumpet being blown. Every time you think it's going to stop, it keeps going and going and going for minutes on end. The noise of it rattles through the entire building, so much so that you feel the need to step outside and investigate where it's coming from. However, the second you open the door, a deadly pointed arrow sticks into the wood next to your head at high speeds. You're getting the royal experience after all, but sadly that royalty is either Russian or French. As the trumpets finally stop, you look up and see a group of strange goblin-like beings gathered at the top of the nearby stairs. Each one is carrying a bow and knocking an arrow, preparing to fire them straight through your heart for intruding on their precious tower. These are the archers, and between the soundings of the trumpet, the towers are their domain. So you better skedaddle, explorer, unless you fancy getting turned into a pincushion with depression, hoping that today won't be the day you die, especially considering you're going to encounter something oddly cute and wholesome later in the video, we promise. You turn on your heels and begin running back down the stairs, adopting the serpentine evasion style to avoid the arrows flying all around you like murderous wasps. In less time than you would have previously thought possible for your feeble little body, you make it to the bottom of the tower and hightail it out of there, as the area around you is positively peppered with arrows. You throw open the door and make a run for it out into the fields again, eager to avoid being killed by a gaggle of ornery medieval goblins who've loaded all their skill points into archery. You're probably already half a mile from those accursed towers when the volley of horns comes in again, finally signaling that the towers are safe once more. Not that you intend on taking your chances like that again. You continue traversing the fields, feeling proud of yourself for getting out of there so quickly. You stop to take a celebratory sip of almond water from one of the pockets on the ground. Its sweetness replenishes you. It makes this crazy world make sense again, if only for a brief moment. There's something curious and enigmatic about level 10, something that lends itself to a mystery, almost begging to be unraveled. Once a group of explorers on level 5, the infamous Terror Hotel, happened upon a Polaroid camera and a pile of notes next to a puddle of mysterious dried liquid. The camera contained several pictures, but all of them were of the vast, misty fields of level 10. The explorers were also able to compile the stack of notes next to the camera, which went as follows. I've been walking for maybe six days, and there's nothing but this dirt road and the fields surrounding it. I tried going off route, and I got put back on the path. There's almond water in the fields. It tastes sweet. I've been hearing trumpets and roaring in the distance, and I saw something in the fog. I snapped a photo of it. I can't identify it right now. If you hear someone yell fire, go back to the path immediately. Someone just shot a goddamn arrow at my shoulder and I'm still bleeding. I think I saw a tower in the distance and someone on top with a bow. Everything's calm. It's silent. She saved me. An angel appeared in the sky, trumpet in hand. If you find yourself in level 10, stay in one spot. She'll find you faster that way. To this day, nobody knows who exactly she is. But hey, if you keep looking, Explorer, you may eventually find out. We just hope that when you do, it doesn't make you regret everything. But really, what are the chances of that happening, right? Be sure to let us know your theories on who she is down in the comments, too. Now that's a long enough almond water break, Explorer. Let's continue. After more wandering, you happen upon something extremely strange. Though, of course, in the back rooms, extremely strange is a highly relative concept. You've seen abandoned farmhouses and stables from what could have been the 1800s. You've found old stone towers straight out of the 1600s, and now you've discovered a strange little town that looks like it's been plucked right out of 1985. This is Malt Town, home to a decent collection of fellow Backrooms explorers and protected by members of the Backrooms non-aligned trade group, who are holed up in a nearby outpost known as the Level 10 Resource Station. It's always relieving to spend some time around other humans down here. You make polite conversation with some of the Malt Town locals, trade some supplies, and share war stories of your journeys through the other levels to get here. It's the first time in a while you haven't felt so alone down here. 
That's when one of the members of the Backroom's non-aligned trade group tells you that, while you're on level 10, you gotta check out the nearby town of New Sodbury. He guarantees that you've never seen anything like it, which is quite an endorsement to receive while in the Backrooms. After receiving the instructions, you venture forth through the fields once again. New Sodbury seems like an oddly whimsical name for the Backrooms, so much so that you become oddly excited by the prospect of getting to see it. After all, the very reason you came down to the Backrooms in the first place was to leave your life behind and explore new worlds. This is precisely the kind of thing you went through all this trouble for. And when you arrive, New Sodbury does not disappoint. The settlement is home to over 10,000 creatures known as the Articali, or the Created Ones. The name may sound a little sinister, but you quickly find the actual creatures are anything but. In essence, the article people are random objects given sentience, with little cartoon limbs like Mr. Peanut and adorable drawn-on eyes and mouths that are somehow fully functional. They can be literally any object, a flower pot, a soda bottle, a sword, a burger, a washcloth, a lamp, anything. They aren't particularly intelligent due to education being prohibitively expensive for most of them, but they are good-natured and generally like to help humans along their way. You stroll around New Sodbury, staring at its many adorable, inhuman residents, who refer to them as the Soddies, with a feeling of childlike wonder. You know that to laugh would be rude and condescending, so instead, you just smile. The backrooms can be a dangerous and sometimes even hellish place, but sometimes it can be truly remarkable too. Though we'll see if you still think that when you see the next level. Welcome back, explorer. You've certainly come a long way to get here, haven't you? After all, level 11 isn't an easy one to reach. To get here, you even had to backtrack through level 9. Regretting your decisions to go through in numerical order yet? <laughs> but hey, we're not here to judge your life choices. We're just here to guide you through the impossible nightmare known as the backrooms. And now, you're in the big city. At least it seems better than that strange fog roiling behind you. Can you hear the wind whistling, explorer? Did you see something move in there? No, you couldn't have. Best to just ignore it and keep moving. You step out onto the vast and empty streets of the new level. This is nothing like the dark, isolated suburbs you've come to know from places like Level 9. There are looming skyscrapers as far as the eye can see. In the distance, you see the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty from New York. But you can also see the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, the famous Gateway Arch of Chicago, the Washington Monument from DC, and the Space Needle from Seattle. It feels like a demented combination of so many of America's iconic cities, but the strangeness doesn't stop there. Due to the inherently bizarre and extra-dimensional elements of the back rooms, many of the buildings appear glitched in some strange way. Some buildings are clipping into one another. Some are juddering violently. Some have doors and windows in illogical places, and some don't have doors or windows at all. You see a surreal sight on the nearby sidewalks, too. Facelings simply walking along like normal people, with hounds on leashes, as though they're just regular dogs. It seems strange to you, but this is the effect this level has on them. They act just like regular people. You keep walking, wanting to see more and still trying to ignore that ominous cloud of fog far behind you. Or did it get a little closer? Probably best just to not think about it right. Out of sight, out of mind. There's a radio lying nearby on the sidewalk, playing a genial sounding host on his very own talk show, Talkin' with Ralph, recorded by the human-like entity known as Ralph, who resides at a building on this very level, known as Radio Backrooms Studios. Ralph helps explorers by dispensing useful advice on surviving the backrooms, like the words fizzling out of the radio right now. I'm sure you've had some problems surviving here. In fact, living here is not that easy. So a few tips to improve your survival skills in the back rooms never hurt, right? That's why today I'm inaugurating a new program called Survival 101. First, my biggest advice is to find a group. Even if you don't plan to join them, most groups are friendly with newbies and will help you adapt to your new life. Some might give you the basics of the back room a guide, 
which is useful but only at the beginning of your adventure. For your first days, I recommend you find Camp Amber on level zero. They're open to trade and can give you instructions to reach the hub, one of the safest levels of the back rooms and critical if you want to wander around. All useful advice, though perhaps a little remedial for someone like you. You decide to wander the area for the next few hours, getting in touch with the different groups and settlements, trading information and supplies whenever possible. Let's do a rundown of all the groups and settlements present here. After all, you have nothing to worry about, especially not that eerie fog a few streets back, surrounded by the dark whistling of the wind. Of course, with the size of this level and the sheer number of livable houses within, it actually has a large civilian population, with no real affiliation to a particular group. These people are known as the citizens of level 11. Some of these citizens belong to a faction known as Maltmart, the people who run stores around level 11 to keep the other permanent citizens and transient wanderers fed. Of course, the major explorer group has a presence here with Base Beta, the fourth main base of the MEG that is still being actively constructed by members of the group. A group known as Camp Amber also has an outpost here. Camp Amber helps people new to the back rooms learn the basic ropes and teaches them the skills to survive and prosper. There's also Insurrection Base 07, where you're sadly not welcome due to your prior interactions with the Major Explorer group. These two really don't get along. For any tech enthusiasts, there's also a group of three people who call themselves the Drone Surveillance Squad with an exclamation point, who use drones to record the locales of the back rooms. Then there's the staff of the Homely Hotel, a bunch of transplants from level five who run a hotel building for any explorers like you who want to take the weight off their feet. No evil cuddled fish men this time, we promise. The Cult of Jerry, the blue parrot from level nine, also have a nice little settlement on this level where they worship their avian god king. They're down the street from the anti-entity agency, a burgeoning group eager to terminate as many entities as they can find. They're certainly less chill than the members of Radical Radio, five teens who dress like they come straight out of 1985 and have a hip new radio show that competes with Talkin' with Ralph. You're on your way to visit Eternal Repository Database 011 Omega when suddenly you hear that strange noise again, the whistling of the wind. It sends surges of icy dread down the skin of your back making your muscles tense up and your heart pump hot tar through your veins. You turn around and see the cloud of thick fog enveloping you, grabbing you with its white, wispy tendrils and pulling you inside into that snow-blind hell of ethereal white, the place where you know something terrible is hiding, waiting for your attendance. You pivot around frantically. It's impossible to see beyond the fog. It's like the world around you has just melted away within it. It's just you now, Explorer. You and the creature within. In the distance, you see something long and black moving, so quickly that you wonder for a moment if maybe you just imagined it. But why on earth would you imagine something like that at a time like this, Explorer? When the fog is everywhere and everything. That's when something moves in the fog again, closer this time. You can hear and feel the whoosh of its sudden skittering, Whatever it is, it's thin but huge. It reminds you of times you spent in the yard as a kid, watching garden spiders deftly navigate their webs with those long, spindly legs as a fly wriggles desperately to be free. You always understood this transaction as an impartial observer. Now, you understand it as the fly. You're trying to get your thoughts together, maybe formulate an escape from this terrible situation, but the wind around you is deafening. You can barely even feel yourself think. And is that you thinking, really? Your mind is suddenly flooded with new memories. Memories you're sure aren't your own. You suddenly remember your parents hunched in the corner of the room, trembling with fear as you approach holding a fire axe, murder burning in your eyes. You remember the people you care about crying because of words you said. You remember your world falling apart and you causing it. You are worthless. You are a curse. You make everything worse. You keep telling yourself these memories aren't real, but if they aren't real, how are they in your head? It's almost like something else, some other entity is forcing the thoughts into your brain. 
They're infecting everything, growing and spreading out like a cancer. You feel like you don't know anything for sure anymore, except one thing. You are in the presence of great evil. As if perfectly timed with the solidity of the revelation, a huge bony hand on the end of an immense black leg clasps around your body. It squeezes so tight you can barely breathe and begins to lift you up from the ground. It's lifting you up towards a body propped up on the same four horrendous insect-like legs. Soon enough you can see its terrible face emerging from the fog. The face is the worst part of it all. It's not that it's inhuman, quite the opposite. It's that it looks far too human, save for its milky white eyes and loose jaw lined with razor-sharp fangs. Every time it breathes, you can hear more of those deafening wind noises bellowing out of the creature's mouth. This entity is known as the Mangled, and in all likelihood, it probably followed you here from level 9. Suddenly, it tilts its head back with a disgusting crunch, and its jaw begins fanning out like a flower, revealing an abyss lined with teeth deep within. You close your eyes and accept it. Your time in the back rooms is over. Your attempt to escape your terrible life has failed. And the worst part is, you know you deserve this. That's when you hear the most awful screeching sound as a huge silver spear pierces up through the mangled's body from below. It spews dark brown fluids as it begins to collapse to the ground, its arms going limp and dropping you too. You scream as you fall before hitting the concrete below, along with the twitching body of the mangled. You notice that the second it hits the ground, the tip of the giant silver spear descends, stabbing through the mangle's head and putting it out of its wretched existence. The wind sound stops and the fog begins to clear. You couldn't be more relieved that the mangled is dead, but now you're beginning to wonder about the entity that killed it. As the fog clears, you see a huge humanoid shape standing before you, at least nine or so feet tall. He's wearing tactical gear underneath a dark black cloak and carrying a huge silver spear. Aside from his size, he seems almost human, but then you can finally make out his face and see he doesn't have eyes. But that doesn't make sense, does it? Because standing before this creature, you have never felt more watched in your entire life. It's like the gaze of a thousand eyes is boring into your flesh. It's almost unbearable. I am the mighty Argos, the entity Argos booms. With my spear of justice, I carry out the law here. I will purge these sinners from this place. I will erase their scourge from my plane. Of course, you think filled with dread, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Saved from the mangled only to be executed by your savior for being the terrible person that you are. Argos is the most powerful entity on level 11, a punisher of sin, who is also impossible to understand and quantify. There aren't even photos of him because all the members of the major explorers group who've encountered him have been killed by him in the process. Somehow, it feels like a fitting irony. Perhaps the perfect end for a life like yours. All you do is sigh and drop to your knees. Do what you have to do, you say closing your eyes and preparing for the strike that brings your existence to an end. But it never comes. How strange. You look up and stare at Argos, who seems to be staring back at you almost quizzically. Why? He asked. With tears in your eyes, you reply, Because I I'm a terrible person. That's why I came here in the first place. I I'm a bad guy and I deserve to be punished. Argos simply shakes his head. I can see deep into you, explorer, he says. I can see the fizzling spaces between your atoms, the parts of your soul you don't want anyone else to see. You have fallen short of your potential, but there is no darkness in your heart. You are better than you believe yourself to be. And with that, the mighty Argos was gone. No clip to somewhere else on the level to punish sinners who violate his immutable law. The same laws that you had apparently not broken. <laughs> well done, explorer. You rise shakily to your feet and brush the dust and grit off your clothes. Another level, another survival. 
You can't help but indulge in a little chuckle about that. You set off towards whatever comes next, enjoying the mild heat of the sun on your face. You don't even realize it at first, but at some point, you start whistling a tune you enjoy just for your own benefit. Perhaps Argos is right. Maybe you're not such a bad person. Maybe sometimes you might even be a good person when the opportunity presents itself at least. Maybe the thing out there that's truly bad is still waiting for you. Welcome back, Explorer. You look tired, and of course we don't blame you. You've had a long journey through the back room so far, and considering some of the terrifying things you've seen over the previous 11 levels, who can blame you for losing sleep? There aren't many places in this frightening dimension where you can comfortably take the weight off your feet and just relax. Do you think you're any safer here? <laughs> well, let's find out. Welcome to level 12, Explorer. We hope you enjoy your stay. As you enter the level, you notice how different it seems from so many of the others. In many cases, levels of the backrooms have been defined by their dizzying expansiveness. An office block that goes on for eternity. The endless winding streets of a city that feels more procedurally generated than constructed by human hands. A field misty and desolate, going on and on and on. But that's not this level. It's a white room, not especially large or small. The gleaming paint job on the wall almost induces a kind of snow blindness. It's an unnatural level of crispness and clarity, like walking into some surreal screensaver. There's a door on the far wall, but strangely, you notice that there isn't a door behind you. Don't worry, you're too well versed in the ways of the back rooms to be bothered by the logical inconsistency of that. You're instead focused on the chair and table sitting in the center of the room, as though you're preparing for a job interview and your interviewer just happened to be late. But you're not late or early. Time is just sort of irrelevant in the back rooms. It's something you've always liked about the place. It'll never move on without you. It'll always move at the pace you do, even if the way it expresses that is by sending a horde of vicious bloodthirsty monsters after you while you run for your life. You have to take the good with the bad on these things, right? The first thing you do is approach the door, of course. It's never a bad idea to see if anything is waiting on the other side. With your free hand, you keep a tight grip on the handle of the revolver that's been with you for so many levels now. Anything that even thinks about coming after you will have six of your tiny metal friends to deal with, and they could move a hell of a lot faster than any entity you'd met so far. However, as you jiggle the door handle, you realize that the door is locked. Well, that figures. Several levels ago, that might have disturbed you or even led you to panic, but you're more of a hardened backrooms veteran these days. <laughs> Every level you've learned has its own logic, its own internal rhythm. If you wish to survive in the backrooms, you need to remain ever versatile. You need to analyze every level on its own terms, with no expectation that it may exist in the same parameters of other levels. You need to learn the rules anew each time and learn how to properly play them. That's why, given the only other objects in the room are a table and chair, you decide to take a load off and sip some tasty, rejuvenating almond water out of your canteen. You spend a moment thinking about how much it would suck to be stuck in the back rooms and have a nut allergy. Would that effectively spell doom for you? It's a frightening yet compelling question. It feels good to be sitting down and take it easy for once. You suffered horrors that would cleave apart the imagination and plunge the average person into a pit of gibbering madness. Not that you want to be dramatic about it, of course, but you've seen everything from eyes that can vaporize people with a glance, to giant underwater horrors, to evil conglomerations of pipe cleaners lurking around in a cursed hotel. You've lived about 30 horror movies worth of pure nightmares. You deserve a break, explorer. But there's a problem. It seems that whenever you take a moment to rest, all of the problems you were worrying about on the outside suddenly return. Your regrets about your family and friends, your fears about your worth and mortality, your doubts about whether you have an intrinsic meaning as a person. You breathe a sigh and shake your head, wishing all the thoughts in your head would settle down for a minute and let you rest. There's an eternal debate raging inside you. Which do you prefer? the nagging existential dreads from the old world that seem to be tattooed between the folds of your brain, or the immediate life or death threats that seem to lurk around every corner here in the back rooms. 
You can't help but laugh at the surreality of this. It's like asking, would you rather be kicked in the face or punched in the crotch? There's truly no winning. Your moment of self-pity is thankfully interrupted when someone else enters the room. This startles you. Much like your average gamer, it can be days or even weeks between moments where you encounter other human beings. And even in these moments, you can't help but wonder, friend or foe? Reality or illusion? Are you a human being or just a skin stealer wearing one? The stranger who's entered the room is a tall, muscular woman with brown skin wearing a gray vest and camo pants. Her arms are well built and covered in old scars. Her black hair is drawn up into a ponytail. She carries a large military-style backpack on her back with impressive ease. You think about going for your revolver again, but you intuit that if you do, it may end up getting pulled from your hands and shoved back into your mouth. Instead, you decide to be polite and greet this new stranger, welcoming her to level 12. She asks you if you're an entity that comes with the level, still seemingly slightly on guard. You stifle a laugh and tell her no. You're just a fellow explorer, waiting for something to happen. She smiles and comments that everybody is always waiting for something to happen, then introduces herself as Trish. Before you even have a chance to get up and offer her your chair, seeing as you've already been sitting down for a little while now, she slings her bag off her shoulder and takes a seat on the table. Already you can feel your worries from before being pushed to the wayside. Being here with another human, actually talking, is a welcome distraction from the horrors that have come before, and the horrors that will surely come after. Here with the achievements and the survival you've gained, you feel more confident talking to strangers. You've earned your place here. Trish asks how you got down here, and you recount the story we've been telling over the course of these videos. You hated your life on the outside. The reality is that there was no place for you in that world anymore. And that's a reality you had to face. After getting interested in the legends of the backrooms through reading about them on various niche internet forums, you decide to take the opportunity to escape into this strange new world and leave the old you behind. Because you were nothing special before. Hell, you were nothing, period. Here, you have the ability to reinvent yourself. While you tell the story, Trish just seems to listen and nod intently. There's a strangely profound calm to her, like someone who has seen it all and lets it all roll off her back. But it's been quite some time since you've encountered a good listener. So maybe you overdo it, but really, it's just nice to have an opportunity to get it all off your chest, isn't it? When you're done, you feel self-conscious about talking about yourself so much. So you ask Trish about her story. She seems reluctant at first, but you say to her, who knows how long they'll be on this level. The backrooms is unpredictable like that. So the two of you might as well swap war stories to pass the time here. She chuckles when you use the phrase, war stories. Trish reaches into her vest and fishes out a pair of military dog tags with her thumb, before letting them fall limply against her chest. You were just politely curious about her story before, but now you just have to know. After some polite bugging, Trish finally relents and begins to tell the story of how she got to the back rooms. A few years back, she was one of the many soldiers deployed by the US military in Afghanistan. She'd seen terrible things during her deployment, friends and innocents dying in acts of stupid, unnecessary violence. Her second tour was almost at its end when her NCO told her and a small group of three others to investigate an abandoned house in a nearby village, where intel had reported suspicious activity. When her little group entered the building, they noticed that one wall seemed conspicuously darker than the others. Thinking logically, they assumed this might be a false wall hiding a secret room. The last thing they expected was to touch it and then all be no-clipped into the back rooms. Trish and her fellow soldiers had been making their way down through the back rooms ever since, much like you. It didn't take a genius to notice that only Trish was here without the three other soldiers she supposedly entered with. Thankfully, you didn't need to feel insensitive and ask what had happened to the others. Trish sighed and decided to surrender that information voluntarily. They'd lost their first, Colin, on level one, the endless warehouse. They'd missed level zero and no clipped right through a concrete wall. None of them had ever heard of the back rooms before, so this was an entirely new experience for them. This is why Colin, who'd been one of the bravest among them, was so easily ambushed by a group of dullers in the hallway who dragged him away and ate him alive. Trish shuddered. She'd never forget his screams. The second teammate she'd lost, Andreas, had been the most adventurous member of them all. 
He was the kind of guy who took chances. He'd go for the moonshot that everyone else was afraid to take. That's why when they were on level 4 of the abandoned office, he felt immediately drawn to the windows. And as someone who almost underwent the exact same fate, you know how this sad little story ends. Andreas prized open a window hoping to crawl up and get some help. He was instead grabbed by a pair of huge, clawed hands which dragged him into oblivion as he wailed on in horror. Trish breathed a little heavier as she's recounting the fate of her team, but you get the sense that this might be the only time she's ever gotten to tell someone about this. You know well enough yourself, it can be cathartic to share, even when the sharing is painful. The third and final member of her team was lost in level 5. His name was Derek, and he'd been the youngest member of the team. His timidness had kept him safe until now, but it was clear that being trapped in this terrible place had been weighing on his mind. He stopped talking, developed a haunted thousand-yard stare. The horrors of this place were hollowing him out. In some moments, Trish had even noticed him talking to himself. Trish sighed and said, I think it noticed his weakness. It saw vulnerability it could exploit, so of course it targeted him, targeted both of us. They were wandering through the luxurious halls of level 5 when they'd heard a strange voice in their head, deep and refined, but at the same time, it had a cruel, untrustworthy, serpentine quality. Trish knew immediately that these words were not to be trusted, but Derek was seduced by their content. I have a wonderful opportunity for you, the voice said. A way to not only escape, but to know kinds of power and pleasure that you've only dreamed of. All we need to do is make a little deal. By the time the legendary beast of level 5 manifested in front of them, it was already too late. Trish was brought up Catholic. She closed her eyes, feeling the dark power humming off of this cephalopod monstrosity. In her mind, she kept repeating, don't listen, this is the devil. But poor scared Derek had no such defenses. He accepted the deal and shook hands with the beast, and just like that, he was never seen again. Since then, Trish had been traveling alone traversing the back rooms level by level just like you, and using her military knowledge and skills to survive in spite of all the odds being against her. Hearing this, you finally understand just how remarkable it is that you've survived this long. When Trisha's story is done, she thanks you. Nothing will ever make it better, but being able to talk about it all certainly helps. She wishes you luck on your travels, and you do the same for her. We hope you've enjoyed your time on level 12 and the brief respite from the horrors that they've given you, because very soon, it's all going to get oh so much worse. You awaken, feeling carpet against your cheek, the same kind of strange, slightly outdated pattern you've come to expect from the back rooms. What is that peculiar sound you can hear? This oddly tuneless, easy listening music, the kind you might find in an elevator spiriting you away to another world. Music that feels like it was written by a committee of mosquitoes. As you stand, you see these similarly strange patterns on the wallpaper. This place never left the 70s, did it? Still, you'll take it over some limitless wilderness. Time to figure out where you are and how you got here. You rise to your feet and begin to assess the environment around you. It seems as though you're in some kind of lobby, lined with elevators on both sides, and marked entrances to stairways around the back. Near the entrances to the stairways, there's a large front desk with an impossibly thick guestbook sitting on it. Behind the desk, there's a single adult faceling in a classy gray suit. Presumably, you think to yourself, this is the building manager. You recognize this place. At least, in essence, it's much nicer than the hideous run-down apartment building that you used to live in, but it's clearly an apartment building nonetheless. Very clever, explorer. You really are learning from your time here, aren't you? If we were there, we'd offer you a shiny gold sticker, but seeing as we're just a disembodied voice, a welcome will have to suffice as your reward. Welcome to level 13, explorer. The infinite apartment. We do hope you find it nice and cozy. <laughs> Your mind briefly bristles at the thought of the number. As much as it feels silly to admit in a place like this, on the outside, you'd always been the superstitious type. You avoided letting black cats cross your path. You never spilled salt or walked under any ladders, but above all, 
you avoided the number 13 at any cost. It made you thoroughly uncomfortable for reasons you never even understood. Just because of the numerical association, you get the sense that something evil is waiting for you on this level. A kind of evil that you haven't encountered before, even down here in the back rooms. Suddenly, you remember how you got here. It wasn't even your choice. You were in the previous level, the blank white room, when you suddenly just no-clipped through the floor. And now you're here, with a sense of vague dread gnawing at your guts. Wonderful. Isn't the back rooms full of the most delightful surprises? You'd better get moving before something finds you. Because believe us, in the back rooms, something is always looking. You decide to avoid the elevators. After all, you can't trust windows here, so why would you trust a small metal box that traps you inside for the duration of your trip? Those things are unsafe enough in the real world. You imagine that if you stepped inside one in the back rooms, the chamber would suddenly fill with digestive juices and dissolve you into nothingness. <laughs> no, thank you. You're going to get some exercise and take the stairs instead. However, you aren't prepared for just how many sets of stairs there are. They're an iron staircase that seems to just keep ascending, floor after floor after floor. Of course, this was probably to be expected. Nothing in the back rooms goes on for a normal amount of space or time. Why would this apartment building be any different? Your best bet is probably to pick a floor at random and go explore, hoping to find some answers, some goodies, or maybe even some fellow human beings. We're glad that you didn't notice that the floor you happen to choose is floor 13. Chance really does have a sense of humor. The floor is furnished in a similar fashion to the lobby. Dowdy carpets, ugly patterned wallpaper, a kind of stale smell lingering in the air. Like much of the back rooms, something about it just feels a little off. You decide to draw your trusty revolver, the one that's done a decent job of keeping you alive all this time. You're preparing for something dangerous to appear around the corner of the long door-lined hallway. So when that exact scenario plays out, you feel oddly vindicated. There's a low guttural snarling as a hound rounds the corner, its face twisted in an animal malice. It's the first time you've gotten a sense of emotion from a hound, beyond just the animalistic hunger that drives most of the monsters here. This creature hates you, and it wants you dead. So if you want to survive, you're going to need to make it dead first. The hound charges and you level your revolver. No more running. That's not who you are anymore. You draw a bead on the monster and open fire as it gets closer and closer. Six loud staccato booms filling the hound with holes and dropping it to the ground. It lets out a rattling wheeze and dies. That undeniably felt good. You're not just prey here anymore. You're a contender. Almost any entity is as likely to be killed by you in a fair fight as you are to be killed by it. In other words, you've come a long way, kid. <laughs> well done. But as much as we'd absolutely hate to taint the warm glow of your victory, it is important to know that all your actions do have consequences. For example, firing off six shots in the enclosed hallways of an infinite apartment building will no doubt attract plenty of attention. That's when you hear that terrible distant rumbling, getting louder and closer by the moment. You sigh and begin to wonder whether that single moment of badassery was really worth the trouble you're about to deal with. The backrooms certainly knows how to put you in your place. The rumbling is almost deafening when suddenly you turn around and see its source. An absolute avalanche of clumps come rumbling around the corner behind you and give chase. You immediately begin to run as the nasty, fleshy rumbling noises get closer behind you. The clumps are hot on your heels. You can feel all their grasping hands yearning to get a hold of you. Suddenly, going all dirty hairy on that hound doesn't seem like it was such a cool idea. But really, now isn't the time to beat yourself up. You just keep running. Leave the deprecation to us. You turn a corner into another seemingly identical hallway where the only option is to keep running because the pack of clumps behind you clearly aren't slowing down. You're beginning to feel that strain in your legs. Your lungs feel like they're pumping acid, but you can't stop. The last thing you want is to be devoured by clumps in some drab apartment hallway. When you do bite it, you at least want it to be a more exciting demise, right? But we can't always choose how we get to go out. 
Sometimes a crowd of about 40 vicious clumps decide how we get to go out, and they rarely dish out glamorous dooms. All the horrifying entities you faced, all to die from these malformed wads of limbs. How embarrassing. You find an extra reserve of energy within you and surge forwards, sprinting down the hallway at speeds you once would have thought impossible, putting genuine distance between you and the clump collective behind you. Pure survival instinct. You even begin to entertain the idea that you might survive this one, until your foot catches on a snag in the carpet and you fall on your face like a complete tool, while a horde of death quickly approaches behind you. This really isn't how you wanted to spend today, is it? As you force your eyes closed and prepare for death, you hear a door click open next to you. Before you can even open your eyes, you feel a hand, a human hand, you hope, clasping around your wrist and sharply dragging you. You feel carpet burn against your body, and by the time your eyes slide open, the door is being closed behind you. You've been pulled into one of the many apartments lining the halls. The owner, a tall blonde man, his back to the door breathing heavily, has just saved your life. Are you okay there? He asks, and you couldn't be more grateful. The stranger, your savior, tells you his name is Robert, but his friends in the old world always used to call him Bob, so you're welcome to do that too. Bob's apartment has a different vibe to the rest of the building. It seems genuinely comfortable, livable. There are photos of what looks like his family members on the walls and the strong smell of pine fresh air freshener. Bob leads you into the living room and lets you take a load off on the couch. He tells you that he gets the impression you've had a long day. You feel the urge to correct him with, honestly, it felt more like a long life, but decide it would be better to be a gracious guest. Bob seems like a kind man, but there's only one slightly peculiar thing about him. He seems to be avoiding direct eye contact. Of course, it's not the kind of thing you judge a person for. Some tests you took in your early years placed you somewhere on the autistic spectrum, so you're not crazy about eye contact either. Bob asks if you care for tea, and when you politely accept his offer, he scurries off to the kitchen to prepare you a cup. Bob tells you that he's one of the many thousands of residents here in the infinite apartment. If you ask the faceling at the desk for a key, you'll even get a room all to yourself, just like that. Since finding his own little space, he's been rebuilding a new life here, making the most of it. Bob returns soon after and hands you your cup of tea. You take a sip. It tastes a little weird, but you probably have to use almond water here instead of milk so you don't draw any attention to it. He asks you how you got to the back rooms. Did you accidentally no-clip through the ground while you were doing some daily errand? He's earnestly surprised when you tell him you sought out this place on purpose. You tell him you needed a fresh start from what you had before. Bob nods along, listening intently. Oh, fresh start. I get that. You ask him about his story, and he says that he'd be more than happy to tell you. But first, he'll grab some cake from the kitchen. You look hungry. As Bob leaves the room, you perform the typical procedure of nosily looking around his apartment just to kill time. It beats the hell out of being chased by the clumps in the hall. After perusing the books in his bookcase, you decide to snoop at his family photos. That's when you notice something strange. The photographs themselves are normal, but it seems that Bob has scratched all the eyes out of them. How strange. You start to feel a little woozy, a little light on your feet. Something is terribly, terribly wrong here. You turn and see Bob entering from the kitchen. He's smiling, holding a cake in one hand and a very large knife in the other. He says, Oh, you're looking a little under the weather there, pal. Don't worry, I'll give you the first slice. Those are the last words you hear as you collapse and Bob's carpet rushes up to meet your face. When you wake up, your arms are tied to restraints on the wall. On either side of you, there are a pair of skeletons in very similar conditions. Bob is standing across from you, still holding his knife. You think about screaming for help, but you get the sense that it won't help you here. He clears his throat and says, On the outside, the papers called me the eyeball killer. I'm not even the first one to be called that. It's depressing, the lack of creativity. Still, I got lucky, all things considered. The police found all the bodies I dumped in the lake and came looking for me. Of course, I made a run for it, tried to hide out in an old abandoned house on the edge of town, and the next thing I knew, there was some little blip and here I was. Like you said before, a fresh start. And here I can kill as many people as I want. Everyone just believes the creatures do it. Bob gives a diabolical laugh as you try pulling at your restraints. 
this is just your luck. Of course you'd still find some way to run into a literal serial killer in the back rooms. The ropes are bound so tight around your wrists, it seems like you have no hope of escaping them, as Bob draws closer with his huge blade. However, in his excitement to do very unsavory things to you, Bob made one crucial mistake. He didn't tie up your legs. You wait for him to get close enough, raising his knife for the first blow. That's when you lunge out with your feet, taking his legs out from underneath him and sending him tumbling towards you. You dodge away from the falling blade as, just as you hoped, it cuts through the restraints on one of your hands. With one of your hands free, you quickly untie the other and make a mad run while Bob regains his footing. Where the hell do you think you're going? He growls. But you don't intend to answer him. Instead, you run out of his apartment with incredible speed as he hoists himself back up and gives chase. You're running down the hall again, this time with a very human threat hot on your heels, ranting about how he wants your eyes. And you really, really, really don't want Bob to have your eyes, but you also can't run forever. You turn a corner, and at the end of a long hallway, you see one of those damn elevators. While you're still a little afraid that the elevator will eat you alive, you're absolutely certain that if you don't get away quickly, Bob will 100% kill you. So it's better to try your luck with an uncertain fate than accept certain demise, right? That seems like pretty sound logic to you. You power ahead, putting a slight distance between you and the pursuing Bob. Up ahead, you can see the elevator doors beginning to part. Are you about to get lucky? On level 13? <laughs> oh, truly anything can happen in the back rooms. For once, you don't question it. You leap into the open elevator and smash on the door close button until they do, with Bob only moments behind you. You breathe a sigh of relief as the doors close, only for the relief to be annihilated when the blade of Bob's knife slides between the doors. This freak is persistent. You look at the control panel and suddenly realize the elevators don't take you between apartment floors, they take you between levels. You could have skipped this whole stupid thing if you'd stepped into the elevator in the lobby. Cursing yourself for this absurd oversight, you hammer the button for level 14 and watch as the blade disappears as the elevator descends. 13, it seems, really is an unlucky number. You haven't seen something so beautiful, have you, explorer? You walk out amidst the trees, bark smooth and black as pitch, lending them a kind of witchy elegance. It's a luscious red underfoot. The ground is carpeted with a mixture of red grass and crimson leaves that have fallen from the many long, interlocking branches up above. It's twilight. The sky is dark blue and dotted in white clusters of scattered stars. You can hear whispers in the air, the music of the forest. After being in so many terrifying places, you find yourself breathing so easy here. Could this really be level 14 of the back rooms? It seems impossible. It seems too perfect, too lovely to be true. But it is, Explorer. Welcome to level 14. Welcome to paradise. You keep walking, wanting to see more. Your eyes are practically watering with the majesty of it. The air smells like fresh cut grass. In the distance, a fat white moon hangs in the heavens, somehow calming you with its rays. You feel like you're in some exquisite painting you may have seen once in a dream. Perhaps after all your suffering, this level is a reward, a reprieve, an oasis of light in the vast, cold desert of malice. As you walk, you notice more strange things on the ground. Are those bones? distributed amongst the red leaves and grass. If they are, they look to be made of some shimmering crystal, diamond-studded. The moonlight shimmers off of them beautifully. What even is this place? You just keep walking, excited to see what you'll find next, when suddenly, a pang of hunger strikes you. It feels like a crude and ugly urge in a place as pristine as this. Just like the confusion and dread you feel when you reach for your backpack to find a snack, only to realize that somehow, you're not wearing your backpack anymore. How could this be? Your food, your supplies, your weapons, how could they all be? Then you breathe in another lungful of that clean, crisp, slightly perfumed air. 
and your worries are chased from your mind. It's fine. You'll deal with this one way or another. You haven't survived 15 levels of the back rooms by not being resourceful. Whatever is lost can be found again. It's just a matter of being patient and taking everything in due course. But still, you're hungry. You'll need to solve that. You keep walking through the strange woods of this fairy tale paradise, searching high and low for something that can sustain you. That's when you happen upon a dew-kissed apple, laying on the ground amidst the falling leaves. You've never seen a more delicious-looking apple. Carefully, you pick it up and study it. A marvelous specimen that feels like it should be sitting on a teacher's desk in a cartoon. It's plump and shapely, with deep, rich skin that shines somehow even redder than the undergrowth. Your mouth waters just looking at it. You feel your stomach rumble and decide it's time to indulge. You sink your teeth into the apple and eat a sizable chunk. It's every bit as delectable as the apple's appearance would suggest. You feel so good. What is it about this place that makes you feel so calm, so content? Even back in the old world, that was never you. Anxiety ate at you like a pit full of hungry rats. You had trouble sleeping every night because you'd lay awake in bed, staring at the ceiling, being harried by your worries, doubts, and fears. It was debilitating. You couldn't sleep, but there were so many days you couldn't even get out of bed. You were terrified of the world, even before you entered this realm filled with nightmares and monsters. You always had some invisible force kneeling on your chest, making it harder to breathe. But here on level 14 of the back rooms, you can breathe so easy. You drink in the air. You want to get drunk on this place. Some part of you never wants to leave. But you also want to know why you don't want to leave. What's going on here? You keep walking through the seemingly enchanted forest until you happen upon a clearing. A vast, flat plain carpeted with the same red grass. And there are people here. Happy, smiling people all dressed in white robes. It's a wholesome pastoral setting. People dance around a maypole. Others sit at a long table feasting and chatting happily. It's the most truly content you've seen other human beings in the back rooms. The air sings with the most beautiful music, but you can't see anyone out there playing it. Is it really out there? Or just in your head? You can't quite tell. Suddenly some of the dancing people notice you and begin to approach. They're smiling so warmly, their arms extended. You feel so welcomed. You hardly even notice it, but you're beginning to smile. It's the first time in as long as you can remember that you feel like you belong somewhere. The people of level 14 invite you into their clearing to join them in their revelry. They speak about this place with the same kind of reverence that you feel in your heart. They tell you that they'd had terrible experiences in the rest of the back rooms. They'd lost friends and loved ones to the monsters lurking on the many levels. They'd been chased by smilers and dullers, attacked by beasts in the deep, dark waters, and tortured mentally by the beast of level 5. Level 14 was an oasis, a reprieve from the horrors. Why would they ever want to leave? And their words, they resonate with you. You've experienced a lifetime of being unsafe. Is it really so wrong, so selfish, to want to take it easy for whatever time you have left? This place seems so nice. Don't you want to see the rest of it? Don't you want to make a nice little life for yourself here? One of the smiling robed people invites you over to a nearby dinner table. It is a beautiful feast with various roast birds, apples, glass bowls full of delicious-looking berries, succulent sliced ham, and a variety of desserts, from elaborately molded jello to bowls of warm, delicious custard. The first apple was certainly tasty, but you couldn't be more eager to partake in this incredible meal. You take a seat, one seemingly reserved for you, and someone passes you an ornate metal goblet full of a fruity-smelling drink. You drink deeply. It is divine, transcendent. When you place your goblet down on the table, one of the others leans in with a jug and fills it back up. You're surrounded by so many grinning faces, all welcoming you, all wanting you to be here. 
It's such a warm, loving feeling. Is this place heaven? But now, it's time to eat. You and the others congregating around the table begin to fill your plates, cutting away parts of chicken, turkey, quail, liberating slices of ham, grabbing vegetables, and pouring on decadent sauces. After weeks or perhaps even months of energy bars and thermoses full of almond water, to eat real food like this feels like the greatest luxury. You eat ravenously. You want to take your fill, just like all the others. That's when you see one of the people across the table making eye contact with you, smiling. It's a slightly older woman, perhaps in her mid-fifties. Maybe you're projecting, but she seems oddly motherly to you. Are you glad to be here, explorer? She asks. You swallow your mouth full of chicken, washing it down with a goblet of that tasty, fruity liquid. You nod, smiling politely in return. Good, she says. You're meant to be here. This is paradise. It's a beautiful, perfect place. A warm blanket, a soft, protective membrane that keeps us safe from the horrors of this universe. It is kindness and abundance. It is our mother and father. We will stay here, and we will receive its bounty. It is a little eerie, but you decide to continue smiling and nodding. The food is good, the vibes are immaculate, you don't intend to ruin anything. After all, who could blame someone for going a little loopy in the back rooms? It is a stressful place to be, to say the least. Perhaps once, this might have bothered you. Maybe seeing something that seems a little eerie like that, a little off, would have made you feel nervous. You've learned to notice little things in the back rooms, but here, you don't feel that same sense of unease. It's as though, on this level, your brain is being flattened. That's when you notice another apple sitting on the table. It looks just like the one you found in the forest. So red, juicy, and plump. Ignoring everything else, you pick it up and take a big bite. Again, that delicious flavor cascades down your throat. You chew for a moment, savoring the taste, when suddenly, something feels off. It isn't so much the taste, but the texture. You feel like something is moving against your tongue. What the hell is that? You grab a napkin off the table and spit into it. What you see within horrifies and disgusts you. A blob of dark brown mush filled with wriggling maggots. Shocked, you turn and look at the apple you just took a bite out of. It looks rotten and withered, covered in furry mold with browning flesh within. It's alive with hundreds of maggots. You drop it onto the table with a horrified splat. What's wrong? The older woman asks. You look up and gasp. The table is completely different now. The food is rotten and rancid, covered in mold, hungry flies, and nasty, wriggling creatures. The formerly pristine white tablecloth looks like used toilet paper. The robes of the people around the table are equally tarnished. The revelers, the people of level 14, are filthy and emaciated. The grime on them looks almost bone deep. Some of them are chewing on the old corpses of death rats. Others smile with chattering black teeth. There is no music anymore. The air smells like rot. The calm dissipates instantly. You open your mouth to let out a horrified scream, but before the sound can begin, everything is back to normal. It's as though a switch has been flipped. The food looks delicious again. There's music in the air. All the other diners around the table look normal once more, but now, You've drawn attention to yourself. They're all looking at you, smiling. That sense of calm is trying to enter your mind again. But this time, it doesn't feel like a guest. It feels like an intruder. This level is trying to sedate you, to numb your perceptions, to keep you from noticing the truth of the matter. It's like you're in Plato's cave and you've just learned the meaning of shadow. What is seen cannot be unseen. You turn from the table and vomit onto the red grass, drawing even more attention to yourself. Is something wrong, explorer? The old woman asks. You don't want to answer her. You want to get out of this monstrous place. Without saying a word, you climb out of your seat and begin to run back towards the woods. You can hear the people in the white robes rising up from their seats to pursue you, but you don't have time to look back. Not if you want to live. And despite yourself, you now know that you really, really do want to live. Life is full of mixed blessings like that. You keep running back into the woods. 
They still seem beautiful for a moment. The red grass and leaves, the gorgeous dark trees, the shimmering crystalline bones. You blink for a moment, and momentarily, everything changes. The trees and branches are dead, rotten, and wilting. The ground is littered with decaying corpses all laying face down. The whole environment stinks of death, so thick and overpowering you feel the urge to vomit. You look over your shoulder and see the filthy people with soiled robes and hungry eyes sprinting through the forest after you. And lucky for you, their malnutrition leaves them without energy. Soon enough, they fall behind, fading into the darkness. Another blink, and everything is normal again. But you know what's really here. For as long as you live, you'll know. Feeling a little sick of tangling with trouble in paradise? Who could blame you? The back rooms can often feel like biting into a big, juicy, delicious apple. Only to find that there's a worm inside. Or, more realistically, half a worm now. Yummy. The back rooms often evoke some vague feeling of the past. Whether it's the shag carpeting of the 70s, the outdated wallpaper and storefronts of 1985, or even the desolate corporate wastelands that feel all too native to the era of Y2K. Ever feel like you're born into the wrong generation? Too late to explore the Earth, too early to explore the galaxy, but here just in time to browse the many levels of the back rooms. A real land of the lost, where past, present, and future seem to converge and coalesce. You've seen plenty of the past and the present, really enough to fill a lifetime, but you haven't seen nearly enough of the future, have you? Sure, we could get all existential and tell you that, really, we're always living in the future. The present is a single microsecond, a sliver so thin it can't even be perceived. Blink, it's gone. Welcome to the future. We hope it's everything you thought it'd be. Welcome, also, to level 15 of the back rooms, the futuristic halls. You don't know how you got here. You don't know how you'll leave. But that's fine. It's all fine, isn't it? You're just sprinting forward into that eternal future, where all the good stuff is. The exit will be sitting somewhere in that vague, oily mass we call the future. So the best you can do is trust yourself. Trust the instinct that has gotten you this far. And keep going. Keep walking. Keep exploring. If you survived this long, it can't be that counterintuitive, can it? You're going to apply those exact same techniques here and see what happens. Hopefully these dice don't give you snake eyes. A pair of metal doors slide open freely as you approach, reminding you of the doors onto the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. In all those classic Star Trek episodes you watched a few too many times. On the other side, you see the first futuristic hall stretching off to a bend in the distance. It's a delicate mix of metal, plastic, and ceramics, all threaded through concrete, blinding white and sleek silver, with pipes running overhead. You walk tentatively onwards, your footsteps clanking on the ground. You have no idea what could be beyond this strange place, but your mind is already flooding with associations, half-remembered media, experienced near and far. You're staying quiet, letting your heel hit the floor first, and allowing the rest of your foot to slowly, carefully fall. You've seen entities that the old you wouldn't have believed, you don't know what could be lurking in these ascetic, mechanical hallways. From evil robots to futuristic invisible beings. You remember that crappy Resident Evil movie you watched maybe a decade ago, with the hallway full of deadly lasers. That's another thing you're afraid of right now. You don't fancy being lasered into cubes like some miserable human cheese plate. Or what if a panel in the ceiling opens up? and some insane AI-powered minigun descends and opens fire. You try to regulate your breathing as the anxiety mounts. You just need to keep walking down these sleek, futuristic hallways. That's all you need to do. Keep walking. So why does it feel like your heart rate is rising, and your body is boiling up into a rapid-onset fever? Why does your brain feel like a scrambled egg? Your vision blurs. There are needles in your muscles. Are you? Having a panic attack, 
Even though nothing is happening, it feels irrelevant now. All that's relevant is you suddenly can't breathe. You fall to your knees, panting. You just want to feel normal. You want your breath to come back. Why do you feel so afraid, explorer? Nothing is even happening. It's just a hallway. While you have the not unjustified instinct that perhaps this is some kind of anomalous effect caused by the level itself, the reality is far more simple, explorer. You seem to be suffering from a spot of post-traumatic stress disorder. Since coming here to the back rooms, you've experienced so much sudden danger to a far greater extent than you ever have before. It's left an indelible mark on your mind, left your body and mind eternally preparing itself for some unseen horror or violent human lurking just around the corner. Even the safest levels feel like they're full of hidden dangers now. We're sorry that you're going through this, Explorer, but it's a natural side effect of your circumstances. Perhaps, if you decided to just stay put on a safer level a while back, you wouldn't be experiencing this suffering right now. But you didn't come here just to laze around and fall into all the old rhythms, did you? You wanted excitement. You wanted passion. You wanted a life that challenged you, rather than slowly ground you down. And you got that explorer, didn't you? But every sword has two edges. And as you sit on your knees, clutching your throat in these chrome hallways, you're experiencing the other edge of that sword we call excitement. We hope it was worth it. Eventually, you feel the strength and calm to stand again. The panic attack passed. Your ability to breathe returned. You keep walking, taking in the futuristic halls with slightly more reasoned eyes. They just keep going, sometimes dipping or turning slightly but largely remaining the same uniform corridors of a million procedurally generated video game secret laboratories. When you start coming across heavy metal doors that connect the hallways to other rooms, you can barely contain your excitement and curiosity. For many of these rooms, you hear their impending presence before you even see them. The endless thrumming whir of the engines within, twisting servos and gears, the crackle of electricity, You've seen machines like it on earlier levels, but never this sleek and advanced before. Most of the doors leading to them are locked, of course, likely for your own protection. But you can see what's going on within through the plexiglass viewing ports that many of the doors still have. Who built these machines? And what real purpose are they serving now? Most just seem to generate electricity, but for where? Here? Or the rest of the back rooms? but others create actual objects. As you head further in, the nature of these rooms, many viewable through indestructible glass walls, seems to diversify. Some are empty, their walls plain white and held up by metal beams. Others seem to be laboratories once, where some research beyond your understanding perhaps used to take place. And it doesn't end there. There are kitchens, Expansive dormitories filled with three-layer bunk beds, control rooms filled with bullpens full of office chairs, and an assortment of glowing monitors all over the walls. Whatever happened here once, it seemed like it was a truly major operation, like some secret underground government base. But if that's the case, where have all the personnel gone? And almost as soon as you begin to entertain the thought, you start seeing the bodies. There are so many of them, spread all over in clusters. Old enough to just be husks now, little more than dusty skeletons to be. You've seen far more violent and disgusting things in the back room so far, but something about these bodies and the mysterious nature of who they once were and how they died weighs heavily on you. It's time to play amateur detective and take a closer look, because who or whatever killed them all no mind was paid to the concept of subtlety in the process. A blessing and a curse for your admittedly fragile state of mind right now. None of these deaths were natural, of course, but nothing about the deaths seemed like they were caused by a non-human entity. Most seemed to have been killed by improvised knives and spears made from common objects that may have rested around in the various rooms of level 15. What had happened here? 
Had they all gone insane and violent somehow, and killed each other in some kind of deranged level-wide frenzy? You scarcely want to think about it. Monsters and entities killing people is one kind of terrifying. Human beings killing each other is another level of horror entirely. You keep moving, ignoring the now regular smattering of bodies littered all around you. Most of them are dressed like scientists, all of whom, you assumed, once lived and worked here. So horrible. An hour or so later, you pass by another strange room. There are a huge pile of dead hounds, right next to a giant burning furnace of some kind. You need to pour your mind into some other subject or the anxiety of not knowing is going to drive you insane around here. You need to bury your thoughts in the abstract or existing this firmly in the undesirable present is going to drive you insane. So, you ask yourself a question you're surprised that you've never actually asked yourself before. What exactly is the back rooms? Of course, you could probably answer that easily in its barest, most literal sense. It's a kind of multi-part alternate dimension divided into these bizarre, varied levels. But why is all this here? It occurs to you, thinking about it, that the very aesthetic of the back rooms is, for the most part, so strangely man-made. Like we've said earlier, so many of these levels evoke these relatively recent periods of human history, just a little off in some way or other. This means, presumably, that the back rooms as a dimension isn't as old as Earth. After all, how could these levels have come to be without the real-world inspirations coming into existence first? The so-called front rooms that we all call home. Perhaps you begin to ponder that the back rooms exists as some kind of strange residue of human consciousness. Every time a human being has a half-formed memory of their time spent working in a bland office, or a short childhood stay at a strange old hotel, or a late evening trying to find your car in some ominous concrete parking complex. The other half of that memory leaks into the back rooms and influences things. It is everything almost forgotten. Memories without the core human component that makes them live and breathe within the recesses of your mind. Even now, what are you walking through? Hallways. Endless strange concrete hallways. These are by definition, liminal spaces. Places never meant to be a permanent residence, just a transient bridge between two more meaningful locations. The thought isn't comforting. If your theory is correct, you're swimming in the residue of the human psychosphere. You're part of everything deemed not worth remembering, but somehow hangs on, at least partially anyway. Under that definition, maybe you really do belong here. But before you can slip further into these bleak thoughts that ruled your life out there, you hear another human voice that profoundly relieves you. Hello? Is somebody out there? Calls a voice from the other side of a heavy metal door further down the hallway. The voice sounds more confused and surprised than anything else. Eager for a social distraction, you run forward. You're suddenly mindful of your clanking footsteps against the ground the same footsteps that must have alerted this stranger to your presence. Someone or something is always listening around here, it seems. When you reach the door, you call out that yes, somebody is here. You tell the mysterious stranger your name and ask him if he's okay out there. Yes, yes, I'm fine. Well, as fine as one can be down here, the stranger says with a nervous laugh. I'm Enric. I thought I was the only one here. You say that you thought the same and ask him if he knows anything about all the mysterious dead bodies littered around the level. I'm afraid they were all already dead long before I got here. Enric replies, I've been the only one here for so long. I can't tell you how good it feels to hear another human being's voice, even through a wall. And you can't help but feel the same way. You came here to run away from people, from society, from yourself. But occasionally, in the many desolate levels of the back rooms, you're just happy to be talking to someone. Sometimes, a little conversation can really save your life. Welcome back, explorer. Here we are primed and ready for another adventure in the great unknown of the back rooms. I suppose it's easy to imagine your significant 
when you're the only living one wandering through endless cramped hallways filled with the long since dead. How about we change things up a little today? No claustrophobic man-made creations, no suffocating passages or dusky suburbs or vast yet oddly anonymous cities. Instead, let's return to nature. It's perhaps been a bit too long since you've touched some grass, don't you think, explorer? Welcome to level 16. Make sure to breathe in the fresh air while you can. You've no clipped into another strange and alien place. Well, not entirely alien, just alien to what you've seen so far. You've watched enough David Attenborough documentaries about the Amazon rainforest to recognize the lush bounty of biodiversity sprawling out all around you. The towering ancient trees, whose branches and leaves form a dense canopy overhead, pierced by spears of early morning light that fall upon you like the many thick green vines dangling from above. Mist hangs in the air. How can it simultaneously be so humid and yet carry that distinctive early morning chill? Before you, the undergrowth is thick and fertile. Dead leaves, sprawling networks of roots, wet brown mud with the consistency of clay. The only thing that seems unusual about it is the lack of insects and small lizards or snakes skittering and slithering around. The back rooms, after all, has its own unique flora and fauna. Things might appear similar to the world you've always known here, but nothing will ever be quite the same. Even 17 levels in, that still takes some time to adjust to. After all, no matter how acclimated to this world you become, you will never be a native here. Still, you continue your journey, observing a nearby flowing river and the great willowy tree leaning down into the water, contemplating grabbing a vine and swinging across it while bellowing like Tarzan. It's not like anyone would see you here, right? No point hanging on to something as petty as shame in this world. As you run after and try to catch some falling leaves like an excitable child, it begins to dawn on you just how much of the life you had before was dictated by worrying about the thoughts and opinions of people you never respected or even really liked. How many years had you wasted trying to impress the people whose thoughts disgusted you? What a funny way to live, explorer. Funny indeed. Soon you come upon something interesting. The first sign of something man-made here in this world of otherwise unspoiled natural beauty. Something metallic is sticking out of the lower trunk of a huge broad tree. As you get closer, you make the assumption that perhaps it's a machete or a hatchet left behind by some previous wanderer who is hacking through the branches and vines near here. But as you get closer, you see that strangely, no, this isn't the case. The man-made instrument sticking into the tree is an ice axe, the kind someone might use to help them scale a mountain. You then notice that this highly out-of-place instrument was used to carve a brief but frantic message into the tree's bark. The message reads, Beware, it's all going to change. An offering as ominous as it is vague. You've played enough video games in your time to know that you're clearly meant to take the ice axe. You don't know what you'll need it for yet, but you're absolutely certain you'll need it at some point. If not on this level, than on some other. All the objects you discover in the back room seems to find their own uses eventually. You slide the ice axe through one of your belt loops and move on, pondering what it's all going to change could mean. Your pondering is interrupted by an icy breeze. Suddenly, you find yourself shivering. How strange. Why would you be shivering in the middle of a dense, humid rainforest? A minute ago, you felt like you were starting to overheat from the exertion of moving. Now you're hugging your arms around your shoulders, teeth chattering, trying to retain what little warmth you have left. In that moment, the sinister prophecy carved into that tree begins to come true all around you. Trees are sucked into the ground. Thankfully, the message put you on edge, made you alert exactly as intended. You dodge the branches as they're pulled into the earth, knowing you would have been crushed by them if you didn't. 
The mist hanging in the air is replaced by swirling white snowdrifts that sting your skin. You blink and the jungle from before is gone. You're standing in the middle of a vast and unforgiving frozen tundra, leading off for miles towards the sheer cliffs of icy mountains. Just like the warning had said, it has all changed. You don't feel like you're in the Amazon anymore. You're in the Arctic, and you can feel the cold in your bones. You keep moving. You need to move to preserve at least some of the heat inside you. If not, you're doomed to become a part of this frozen landscape. An explorer's sickle, staring forever out of the ice in some slack-jawed horror, like some primitive dead troglodyte. <laughs> oh, but don't feel bad, explorer. If that does happen, at least you can be an entertaining little landmark for whoever comes next. We like to be positive here at Backrooms Explained. As you move over an icy hill, rubbing your arms and shivering so hard you can feel your bones rattling deep within, you feel a profound sense of regret that you didn't bring a thicker coat, or at least those nice mittens you bought last year, but hadn't yet gotten around to using. But right now, you can't get a coat. You can, however, get a plan. And a plan might be able to save you. Might, mm -hmm. of course. Let's not get our hopes up too much. Your eyes turn to the nearest icy mountain as the frigid howling winds around you make your ears ache. If you can get over there and find some kind of cave, you can at least shield yourself from the wind, and perhaps make some temporary shelter or build a fire to stop yourself getting hypothermia or frostbite. It's far from a safe bet, but right now, it's the best bet you have. Stealing yourself, you put as much energy as you can into getting to that frozen mountain. Fortune, it seems, really does favor the brave, because as you reach the mountain, you do indeed find a cave to secrete yourself into. It's hardly warm and cozy, but it's a respite from the lashing icy winds outside, and that makes it feel like a paradise in a pinch. You pull out your canteen, and take a long sip of almond water to revitalize yourself, feeling your breathing steady slightly. Now you need to figure out if anything you have on you can make a decent fire. This whole situation has taught you a lot about the values of carrying around a bunch of dry sticks and fire lighters in case the world around you abruptly becomes a horrific frozen wasteland. You really never know when this kind of situation is going to come up, do you? As you sit there shivering and wondering if maybe freezing to death isn't that bad, after all there are so many monsters that could horribly kill you down here, you hear a strange hissing noise and feel something odd falling onto your head. Instinctively, you reach your stiff frozen fingers up to your hair to feel just what fell into it. More snow, perhaps? But no, it doesn't feel cold. It feels like something coarse and rough and capable of getting everywhere. You look at your hand, of course, it's sand. Shocked, you look up and see cracks forming on the roof of the icy cave above you, and more sand comes pouring out of the cracks. The whole mountain is rumbling around you like an earthquake. Driven purely by your backroom's honed survival instincts, you spring up and sprint out of the cave before it can implode on you, crushing you with its immense weight. But by the time you're out of the ice cave, you're not in the frozen tundra world you ran in from. You're in a vast, scorching desert, the kind of sandy hellscape that would sizzle a cactus to death. The sun seemingly right above you beats down with tremendous force. The mountains of ice that once dotted the landscape are instead replaced with monstrous sand dunes. You're expecting a giant horrifying worm monster to be attracted by the vibrations of your footsteps and spring out of the ground to devour you. That would almost be preferable to the more mundane but upsetting demise of being roasted to death beneath the red hot sun like a slab of cheap beef. You sigh and begin to walk again. You return to the old maxim, if you walk for long enough, you simply have to get somewhere, don't you? Personally, we think it's very nice that you believe that, because, well, we appreciate your optimism. We won't tell you that. Technically speaking, not all backrooms levels obey the typical rules of the space-time continuum, so you can actually keep walking and not move anywhere at all. But please, don't think about that right now. Just stay calm and happy. 
as happy as you can be while feeling like a fried egg. You pull out your canteen again and begin chugging almond water, hoping that one of its rejuvenating properties is preventing this diabolical sun from giving you a severe melanoma. When you're done drinking, you feel how threateningly light the canteen is now, and you begin to worry about your almond water supplies. It is a cruel irony, isn't it? It's been one of the most dangerous and hostile levels so far, and as far as you know, there aren't even any aggressive entities here. The environment itself is trying to kill you. You sigh, and foolishly, we might add, decide to say out loud, at least it can't get any hotter, I guess. And as if on cue, you feel the ground rumbling beneath you, and regret ever opening your big, stupid mouth. That's when a jet of fire blasts from the ground in front of you, just barely missing you as you stumble backwards. You lose your footing and fall back, but instead of your back landing relatively harmlessly against a pile of sand, you instead feel the discomfort of hard, jagged rocks whacking you in the spine. What fresh hell is being delivered onto you now, explorer? The only way to find out is to look and see. You rise shakily to your feet, suddenly feeling an even more intense heat all around you. The sand is gone, replaced by a huge vista made from jet black volcanic rock, cut apart by rivulets of glowing molten lava. Everywhere you look, massive volcanoes belching great spouts of ash and leaking more lava down their sides dominate the skyline. You're in the middle of some primordial nightmare born of fire and rock, a proto-earth, before the proto-conditions for life even form. The air you breathe here feels <laughs> thick and soupy. You don't currently have the emotional bandwidth to be horrified by this situation. Instead, you just stare blankly across the expanse of lava world and say to yourself, eh, this might as well happen. All you can really do is shrug and keep moving. If you walk for long enough, you will reach some kind of destination. And there has to be an exit around here somewhere. Welcome back, explorer. We hope you have your sea legs, because on today's episode of Backrooms Explained, we're taking to the open oceans, or at least, the back room's equivalent, for level 17. Now now, don't panic. We're not dropping you back into the briny depths of level 7 to contend with Tiny and the giant beast below. That'd just be inhumane, and who could accuse us of that? Instead, you're going to be the newest resident of the back room's largest naval vessel, the Carrier. We hope you find it hospitable. Having thankfully no clipped out of the forever altering environment of level 16 before you were frozen, burned, melted with lava, and dehydrated in a desert in the same unpleasant afternoon, you find yourself wandering another old favorite, a tight metal hallway. You can hear pipes gurgling and steel creaking all around you. Distantly, you can hear the ocean lapping at the sides of the ship, a mighty aircraft carrier, in the literal middle of nowhere. However, you're still feeling hopeful. You'll take a seemingly abandoned naval asset over the harsh environment of an endless open landscape any day. After all, in the confines of the ship, you might be able to get your hands on some MREs, meet some fellow backrooms wanderers, or maybe even get access to some new supplies and weapons. After all, these last few backrooms levels really haven't been too kind on your attempts to gather supplies. Nobody said this experience would be a picnic explorer. But you keep on walking down the narrow corridors of the carrier's lower levels, cringing at every pronounced clank your footsteps seem to make. You've learned on so many levels now what a terrible idea it is to draw attention to yourself in the backrooms. As the old saying goes, when the fox hears a rabbit scream, he comes running, but not to help. You make turns, twisting your way through various reinforced doors and bulkheads. The inside of the carrier seems to have the same labyrinthine internals as so many other levels. However, what's particularly frustrating about a backroom's labyrinth is the fact that they are under no obligation to be fair or make sense. Things become a lot less predictable when you're required to lose your more conventional sense of reality. In the back rooms, truly anything can happen. But that's not always a bad thing. You know this firsthand. 
because soon enough, you come upon what appears to be an armory, hidden behind yet another reinforced door. You twist the valve until you hear the satisfying pop of the door's locks disengaging, and the scrape of its hinges sliding open. On the inside, you see a truly glorious sight. Racks upon racks of weapons and ballistic vests. As you step inside, you feel like Neo in that one scene from the first Matrix movie. You're truly spoiled for choice, but you decide you'll keep it simple. You grab a handgun, a ballistic vest, and what you assume is a pump-action shotgun. You decide not to mess around with the grenades. You know your own luck. You'll probably just fumble it and blow yourself to smithereens, you clumsy, hairless ape. With your newfound armaments, you decide to set off once again and see what you can find. Level 17 has been kind to you so far. A little seasickness here and there aside. So perhaps there are more goodies waiting for you. Who knows? This might even be one of those rare chill levels you sometimes find. Which always feel like a wonderful treat. These are the nice, cozy thoughts passing through your mind. When you suddenly get shot in the back. But hey, you're not entirely unlucky. The shot seems to have come from quite a distance away. And thanks to the ballistic vest you had the foresight to purloin, it really only feels like someone whacking a baseball bat into your back with tremendous force, cracking a couple of ribs and laying you out against the cold metal ground. That's when you hear the voices behind you. One of them says, Why the hell did you shoot him, Jonesy? The other, quivering in a way that betrays a kind of strained paranoia and panic, says, He was an imprint. I just know it. He gave me the feeling. Imprints? That's a new one. You think to yourself, as you desperately try to summon the strength to stand, despite the sudden and immense pain in your back, you can hear a pair of footsteps getting closer, and hope that whoever these two are, they're not fans of implementing the classic double tap. That's when you hear the telltale click of a gun being loaded, and a sudden rush of adrenaline springs you back up to your feet, as though you've just been given an electric shock. You turn and see the two people coming down a hallway adjacent to your own. Both shocked strangers, wielding rifles. As the two instinctively shoulder their weapons, assuming that you are indeed whatever an imprint is, you leap out of the way, darting down the hallway out of view. The two strangers waste no time in opening fire. The reports of their rifles are deafening in these tight metal hallways as are the loud ting-ting-tings of their bullets ricocheting off the walls. You need to get out of here before this pair of paranoid weirdos turns you into ballistic Swiss cheese. You make a sudden turn through a door at the end of the hall and find yourself staring up the shaft of a large metal stairway. It's too late to turn back now. You can hear the distant footsteps of the duo getting closer. All you can do now is start running up the stairs and hope they don't find you. We just have one question. Are you feeling lucky, explorer? Well, are you? Sorry, we won't load the question, but your two new friends are loading their rifles. So you start sprinting up the stairs as quickly as possible. By the time you're halfway up, the two strangers enter the stairwell below you and begin opening fire, sending a volley of bullets up through the stairs below you. Thankfully, these two are no marksmen so none of the shots make contact, though some, you may readily admit, get far too close for comfort. You just do what you do best, explorer. Keep running. Part of you wishes you could just stop and reason with the people chasing you, but you get the sense you're probably past that now. They truly believe you're an imprint, whatever that means, and to be an imprint appears to be a capital offense. Of course, you have the handgun and the shotgun that you picked up, but even in a life-or-death situation, the idea of turning those weapons against actual people sickens you. You've fought off and even killed entities in the back rooms before, but do you really have it in you to take a human life, even if it means saving your own? But you can't spend too long contemplating ethics, because those two strangers are running up the stairs again. The best you can do is keep moving, and make sure you remain out of their iron sights, so you keep running darting from hall to hall at random, passing through different doors in hopes of making sure that they lose your scent. This plan ends up paying off, 
Because after a few minutes of frantic evasive tactics, you can no longer hear their footsteps. It seems like you've lost them. Well done, explorer. You take a moment to sit down and breathe heavily as the adrenaline wears off. You feel that dull, throbbing ache in your back again, where the bullet struck your ballistic vest. You're furious at every movie you've ever watched that showed some action hero or super cop shrugging off gunshots with the help of a handy bulletproof vest like it was nothing. In reality, it hurt like hell. Though at least you're still alive, for now. Perhaps some almond water will help ease the pain, if you can find any out here. When you've regained some energy, you rise to your feet again and continue walking down the desolate halls of the carrier. You haven't seen any rooms in a while. No barracks, no engine or maintenance rooms, no supply rooms, not even another armory. Just more of those winding, bleak hallways. Occasionally, you come upon some hallways that look flooded, with busted rivets in the wall letting jets of water spew out of the metal underneath, leaving a shimmering pool on the ground. Your time in the back rooms has taught you that, oftentimes, hideous beasts lurk in the waters. So you make the wise decision to stay away from any hallways that look like they might lead you further into the depths. Really, you're a landlubber at heart, and you're not afraid to admit it. Naturally, when you pass into a new hallway and see a human-shaped figure standing in the far end, you're immediately on guard. You don't intend to make the mistake of your attackers and adopt a shoot-first, ask-questions-later mentality. Instead, you shoulder your shotgun and carefully approach. You even call out, Hey, I don't want any trouble. I'm human, just like you. I just want to talk. You wish you'd been treated with the same courtesy. But, as you get closer, you get the vague sense that something is wrong. For starters, isn't it peculiar that this stranger hasn't reacted yet? The back rooms trains you to be cautious and jumpy, especially if something new suddenly approaches you from behind. Could this be a faceling that's wandered into level 17? No, a faceling still would have reacted to your voice. And how come you're the one with the two guns and the ballistic vest? but you're also the one feeling nervous this time. It doesn't make sense. Then, the stranger turns, and your body is suddenly awash in icy dread. This isn't a human. They look almost like one, but you know, deep down in your bones, that this entity is the furthest thing from human. You feel like you're surrounded by long, clawed hands, piercing your skin with their fingernails. You're wise enough to follow your intuition and avoid looking at the entity's face. Little did you know, if you'd made eye contact, it probably would have spelled death for you. We suppose you're not that unlucky after all. This almost human entity is an imprint, the same creature those two gun-toting, trigger-happy strangers thought you were earlier. And who could blame them for being cautious? Well, you could, considering they almost killed you. But it's understandable that an encounter with an imprint and their inherent dread-inducing properties would leave a person a little shaky. They were lucky that, like you, they didn't look directly into the eyes of one of these creatures. If that happens and you're fortunate, you'll be rendered unconscious for several hours. If you're less fortunate, gazing into the eyes of an imprint is a one-way ticket to instant brain death. Imprints, as far as we're aware, are flawed copies of people who previously wandered level 17. We don't know what exactly causes them to exist, but we do know it's best to avoid them at all costs. So you make the sensible decision and hightail it in the other direction until those feelings of unease wear off. It really is just your luck that you'd encounter your two gun-loving friends in the hall, isn't it, Explorer? Of course, wanting to find a diplomatic solution to this whole mess, you try your best to explain that you're not an imprint. But one of the two terrified gunmen simply replies, That's exactly what an imprint would say! And the chase promptly begins. Now, though, at the end of your tether, you're seriously considering just shooting these guys and being done with it. But that isn't what you do. Instead, 
You keep running, from hallway to hallway, from stairwell to stairwell, always going up and knowing those two paranoid maniacs are hot on your heels. You keep running until you find yourself in a decidedly different room, some kind of viewing deck with large windows leading to the outside, each one letting in these strange, shimmering shafts of light. Something about it reminds you of the light that came out of the eyes of the neighborhood watch. Light that was deadly to the touch. Still hearing the footsteps coming towards you, you run across the room, making sure to duck below the light. Your pursuers, however, have no such tact. They run into the room, thirsty for your blood, guns locked and loaded. But the second their bodies pass into the light, everything changes. Their bodies are rooted in place as they begin to violently spasm, choking on seemingly nothing until water gushes out between their lips. They flail powerlessly for a few minutes while you watch in horror, before collapsing onto the ground, water dripping from their mouths and forming a puddle beneath them. The light, it seems, makes people drown just by touching them. You exhale, a little traumatized by what you've just seen, and think to yourself, God, I need to get off this stupid ship. Welcome back, Explorer. Gotten over the seasickness of the previous level? Don't worry. There won't be any gung-ho survivors shooting at you here. We promise. And would we ever lie to you? Lucky for you, enough wandering through those dark, wet corridors leads you to clipping to somewhere entirely new. Through a vapor that smells like cotton candy and the burning dust inside a boxy old analog television, it smells like childhood. You close your eyes, feeling an immense pressure compressing your entire body until it stops. You open your eyes and you're somewhere new. Or is it somewhere very old? Either way, welcome to level 18, Explorer. And thanks for the memories. You realize you're not standing anymore. You're sitting cross-legged, like a child, on a colorful carpet. You look up to see the garish room you're sitting in and you're hit with deja vu, like a runaway freight train. The rudimentary pencil and crayon drawings on the wall. The alphabet garland snaking around the space where the wall meets the ceiling. The posters detailing facts about animals, science, and half-hearted anti-bullying messages. All those tiny chairs and desks, and the blackboard covered in scribbles. You're in your second grade classroom. Miss Taylor's class, yes. You remember it clear as day, though you probably haven't actually set foot in here in 20 years. And no, for once, we don't mean that it looks similar to Miss Taylor's class, or that it evokes connecting memories. This is Miss Taylor's classroom, exactly as you remember it, even down to the Darth Vader pencil topper on her front desk that you used to think was so cool. How is this possible? Have you gone from a world where you're irrelevant to a place where you truly are the main character, if this world is drawing directly from your memories? Okay, well, hold your horses a little there. I'm afraid it isn't that grandiose. Level 18 is a little more metaphysical than many of the previous levels. It's a generally highly personal experience, made from the significant or formative memories of whoever is subjectively experiencing it at any given time. And for you, for some reason, it's Miss Taylor's second grade classroom. What did this place mean to you, Explorer? What happened here? Why is such an innocuous place so important? You've taken in the scenery of this nostalgic room quite enough. You rise to your feet and prepare for a good old fashioned explore, an activity that you've grown extremely accustomed to throughout your time in the back room. Perhaps because you're walking around in an externalization of your own memory, you feel as though you're innately aware of how to find your way around inside here. Or, at the very least, you hope. As you head towards the hallway near the back of the classroom, you see photos of previous classes affixed to the walls. You take a step closer and look at them. All the little children lined up with the teacher for the photo. There's something wrong with their faces. All of them except Miss Taylor. Their features aren't entirely gone, like a faceling, but they're configured incorrectly. Eyes, mouths, and noses seem to be scattered randomly across the children's faces. 
Your best guess is that it's because memory is fallible. You can't remember what these children look like. So your mind is filling in the blanks. Why would you have remembered these kids you never met? You continue out into the hall, and you're struck by a somewhat eerie feeling. More so than other areas in the back rooms. You feel like you shouldn't be here. It's like you're an intruder. Your mind is flooded with memories of parent-teacher evenings, where you were left to wander around the school's hallways at night, the lights mostly off, feeling like you'd broken into a place where the universe was slightly altered. But here, you're in a different universe entirely, Explorer, and you know something awful is waiting for you. At the end of the hallway, you find the school library. You know it before you even see it, because when you open the door, you're assailed with the strong smell of the librarian's coffee and the scent of dusty old paper. You spent so many hours in that library over the years, disappearing into the fantastical worlds of books. Your escape, your respite from how hard and cruel reality could often be. It gives you a warm glow inside to be in there among all those childhood favorites again. Until you remember the second floor. Just the thought of it sends a shudder down your spine, even as an adult. It's remarkable how things like this can still hold power over you all these years later. All the kids back then spread rumors about the second floor of the library being haunted. Really, it was a glorified storage area, connected to the library below an old creaking set of metal stairs. There was a prop up there, a strange, malformed human body, made out of paper mache years before you were even born, probably made for some school play or Halloween party. But it waits up there in the dark. The kids back then would dare each other to walk to the top of the stairs, while the rest just stood there and watched. The brave ones made it up halfway, but none of them ever made it up all the way. You remember trying it yourself. You felt so courageous to begin with, but the second you saw that dark shape, the body, waiting for you up there, your resolve melted. You ran back down those stairs faster than you thought was physically possible, while all the other kids just watched and laughed at you. It was good practice, Explorer. Look at how well all that running has done you now. You know better than anyone that sometimes running is all you can do. The memories get to be too much, and you decide to leave the library. The bad vibes of the second floor erase whatever goodwill the memory of books long since read might have given you. You get that nagging feeling you sometimes get in the back rooms, where it feels as though your thoughts aren't your own, and that some alien force is insinuating concepts into your brain. It's a scary feeling, to feel as though the boundaries between you and everything but you are beginning to blur. It's dread, pure and simple. The dread of disappearing, of fading away. That's when the whispers start. As you walk down the long school halls, trying to remember the way out, cruel whispers begin to invade your mind. They don't say anything you haven't thought before, but they do it with such venomous intensity that you find it startling. It reminds you of your horrific hallucinations on level 6. They start slow and quiet at first, so you just keep walking. But soon enough, the mysterious whispers in your ears are too loud to ignore. Remember when your mother left you behind in the supermarket and didn't come back for you for hours? Remember when you flunked that test and your father didn't let you eat for two days as a punishment? Remember the time the bullies found you alone in that park and beat you until you couldn't even get up and walk away? Remember when they rejected you? Remember all the times you were hungry, alone, and afraid? Remember seeing the man from the dark. Their words are hot and suffocating, reminding you of some of the worst times in your life before, feeling like hands tightening around your throat. Before the hyperventilating can start, you're lucky enough to see a fire exit. You'll do anything for a little fresh air right now, so you run towards it, gritting your teeth and hope that those evil, poisonous whispers stop. It feels like salvation when you push the door and spill out onto the playground the soles of your shoes squeaking against the blacktop like so many years ago. The whispers have stopped, for now at least. That's a relief. You take a deep breath in and exhale. Who would have thought that it'd take going to the back rooms to finally make you adopt some healthy coping mechanisms? 
knowing some horrific entity could kill you at any moment. Still, now isn't the time to get all existential. Instead, you look up at the clear blue sky and the shining sun. You could easily imagine you're in the old world. What a joy it would be to start again, to make better choices, to avoid all the mines. Now you know where they're all planted. But as a Greek playwright once said, one thing is denied even to God, to alter the past. Instead, you decide to explore this long buried memory some more. Walking around the playground, scoping out the old basketball court and the faded hopscotch lines. Did you have fun here once? It's hard to remember. It's as though something else happened here. Some black hole that draws all other memories and feelings towards it. What happened here? That's when you hear the voice and you feel yourself getting cold, as though an icy breeze has cut across the playground, despite the sun above. Hey kid, why don't you come over here? I want to show you something. Your head turns slowly as though on a crank, seeing the grassy embankment that slopes down to an old chain-link fence, the only thing separating the playground from the world outside. And that's where the dark figure stands his blurry fingers gripping the metal of the fence. His breaths are deep and ragged. You walk to the edge of the grass, not in control of your actions. A little closer, he says. You won't be able to see from there. His voice sounds like a disease. It makes your skin feel dirty. You get the sense that you shouldn't come any closer. If you stay away from the fence, he can't hurt you. You just need to stay away from that fence. Closer. He repeats, just a little closer. Are, are you an entity? You ask. The man on the other side of the fence just laughs. You still can't make him out. He's one with the shade of the trees beyond the playground. Don't you remember, James? He says, I've always been here. I'm part of this memory, silly little kid. Didn't your mommy tell you not to talk to strangers? You stammer out, I'm not a kid anymore. The man lets out a long, hissing breath and says, You're always a kid here. You're not quite sure what to do. This man, is he telling the truth? Is he some entity? Or is he why you're even remembering this place? Something that happened here long ago. Something you repressed. Maybe you should ignore your instincts. Maybe you should get closer. Investigate. That's when you feel something tap against the back of your leg and turn around, startled. It is quite literally the last thing you could possibly expect. A pink plush dinosaur, teetering on a pair of awkward legs, smiling at you with shiny black plastic eyes. It's one of the cutest things you've ever seen. It is, appropriately, mostly known as the plush dino. It shakes its head, as if to say, don't go down there. And without a single word, you know to believe it. It turns and walks away, and you decide to follow, knowing on some level that this must be some kind of steward on this level, an unambiguously positive force, a wonderful thing in the back rooms, for there are so few of those. It will lead you out of this strange and frightening episode of your distant past. You don't turn back, but you hear the poison voice of the man behind the fence calling after you. One more time. I'll see you again, James. And you'll see me too. You just keep walking, following that adorable little plush dino. You know, so many have come to this level and never wanted to leave. They're bewitched by their nostalgia. They want to stay in their memories, in a foggy recollection of their past, forever. And not even the adorable plush dino can help them. We suppose sometimes, Having a terrible childhood has its advantages. Welcome back, Explorer. Do you know where you are? The back rooms, obviously. But do you know where you are right now? It's dark and musty. The air is thick with dust and haze. There are boxes everywhere. They look so old, barely held together by persistent strips of scotch tape. It takes a second for your eyes to adjust. You'd just been subjected to the harsh glow of an early memory. The gloom here seems almost alien. At least it isn't like some of the earlier levels, where the darkness was so heavy and tangible that no light could possibly pierce it. In that regard, 
We suppose you're lucky. But soon enough, you'll find out that there is something far worse than darkness lingering in the air up here. The only open question is whether you'll find out before it's too late. Welcome to level 19. Be sure to breathe it in. You adjust relatively quickly to your surroundings. The smell of moldy old clothes and mothballs up here is hardly pleasant, but it's something you can live with. In fact, it brings up memories. But now is no time for nostalgia. You're an explorer after all. It's time to explore. You begin a careful journey across the old wooden floorboards beneath you, each one giving an audible creak under your weight. The roof above you is arched, buttressed into place by what looks like equally old wooden planks. Every so often, you see vintage furniture, old tables, chairs, and armoires, stacked up along the walls, some covered in tarps, and others left to gather dust, like everything else. Do you recognize this place? No, you tell yourself. That can't be right. It must just be the lingering after effects of the memory field of level 18. You just need to ignore it and keep on moving, don't you? It isn't that tight a fit, but still, there's a lingering sense of claustrophobia to this place. Like most places in the back rooms, there's no obvious exit. But here, that fact seems to really weigh on you. As you walk further and further down the attic, it begins to occur to you that it might never end. The Forever Attic, where every dusty old childhood thing is stored. Every gift never given. Every Christmas and Halloween decoration. A mansion of cobwebs, with six generations of spiders who've never known anything else. It sends a shudder down your spine. This is not a good place. Or is it? As if a switch has been flicked, suddenly, your disposition reverses. The growing sense of unease you were feeling before is now replaced with a warmth emanating from the middle of your chest, fanning out through you, spreading comfort and tranquility. You exhale, your breath causing the dust particles in the air to spin and twirl. Everything is right with the world. Somehow, you just know it. It's like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And we aren't just speaking metaphorically here. You can't help but notice something amongst the dusty old floorboards in front of you. A faint light, seemingly flowing out from between the floorboards. You feel yourself drawn to it, like a lizard seeking the warmth of the sun. Whatever that strange, orange glow between the floorboards is, you need it. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel happy. And things that do that are few and far between down here. Aren't they, explorer? You approach the floorboards with the orange glow and drop to your knees, pressing your fingers and face against the dusty old wood, not even stopping to consider that you might get splinters. Nothing could put a damper on the peace you're somehow receiving from this orange glow. It reminds you of simpler times, times before fear, before doubt, before the curse of self-awareness, the Halkion days when you still believed that everything might be okay, when all is said and done. That's when you remember exactly where you recognize this place from. So many years ago now, when you were just a little kid, you went to go spend a week with your grandparents while your parents were working through something. You remember your grandpa leading you up into the attic and showing you all of his old mementos from the war, a few rusty old medals in a tin cigar box, his dog tags, and even his service pistol. It blew your young mind to see such a connection to living history right in front of you. And once you were done, he'd lead you back downstairs, where your grandmother would have a tray of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies waiting for you. Just thinking about it makes a warm, contented smile spread over your face. But you're pulled from your blissful trance by a familiar sound. Your stomach growling. Suddenly it dawns on you that it's been a long, long time since you've eaten anything. And you'd better rectify that very soon if you don't want your journey in the back rooms to end before you hit level 20. That would just be humiliating, don't you think? You rise shakily to your feet, not exactly eager to leave behind the comforts that the orange glow under the floorboards provides. Sometimes comfort needs to take a back seat to the bare necessities. You continue trudging down the length of the infinite attic, the floorboards once again giving their telltale creak underneath your alien footsteps. There are boxes everywhere. Surely one of these boxes contains something safe for you to eat. There's a nagging pain in your stomach that feels almost unbearable now. 
How is it possible that you didn't notice this feeling before? Was the orange glow that enrapturing? Hungry, hurting, and impatient. You grab the nearest box and tear it open. It's full of Christmas ornaments, porcelain baubles, and tiny ceramic Santas with fading paint, garlanded by garish vines of tinsel. Nothing of use here. But what if there's something tasty underneath? You grab a bauble, clearly not thinking straight, and stare into the box, only to see more baubles underneath. In a state of mild delirium, you let the bauble in the box fall to the ground. The box itself clatters, but the bauble, strangely, does not. In fact, the second it makes contact with the floorboards, it doesn't shatter. It simply crumbles silently into dust. If you were in a better state of mind, that's the kind of thing you might notice. But right now, all you're focused on doing is getting yourself some grub. You search box after box, only to be disappointed again and again. Christmas decorations, Halloween decorations, dusty old knickknacks that even a thrift store would turn down. You feel like a child blowing their parents' money on endless mobile game loot boxes, only to get a dud every time. Except rather than just having to face up to a very angry mom and dad with a devastated credit card, you feel like your guts are tying themselves into knots. Food. 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 It has to be somewhere in here. You need it. And eventually, you do indeed get lucky. You find a dusty old chest, the kind a cliched pirate might bury his treasure inside, and you pop open the latches. Within, there's a smorgasbord of delicious treats, somehow perfectly preserved. There are crisp fruits and vegetables, neatly cut sandwiches, and delicious freshly baked cookies, just like the ones your grandma used to make. It seems too good to be true and it wouldn't be the first time something in the back rooms tried to get you with a classic honey trap. But you're too hungry and delirious to even mind. All that matters to you right now is finally getting to eat. You reach in and grab handfuls of food, ready to stuff your face when something horrifying happens. The second you remove the food from the confines of the box, it begins to decay rapidly. In a matter of seconds, it becomes a breeding ground for some unidentified furry mold. Seconds later, it's falling apart in your hand and dripping to the floor in unpleasant brown globs, which soon fizzle away into nothingness. It's like watching weeks of rotting take place in less than a minute, just like the bauble that practically dematerialized before your eyes earlier. Turns out, this place is even more inhospitable than you first imagined. But I'm sorry to say, Explorer, your pain is just getting started here. You rise once again, gripping your aching stomach with both hands, as you turn and run back towards the floorboards with that inviting orange glow. Surely, the glow will make it better. The glow has what you need. But by this point, the ambient anomalous effects of level 19 have already started creeping into your frazzled mind. As you try to fumble your way back towards the orange glow down the winding hall of the infinite attic, you feel a sudden and crushing sense of paranoia hit you like a meteorite. It's as though a thousand strange eyes have opened up on the walls around you, all just watching, judging. You can feel their stares, like something is out to get you, even though you know nothing is there. Though in the back rooms, can you ever really know nothing is there? Still. You know above all else that you need to get back to the sanctity of the orange glow, the only thing that seems like salvation amongst the horrors of level 19 and its many cruel tricks. You know on some level that your fear and anxiety and paranoia will finally dissipate if only you manage to get back there, but you quickly begin to realize that it isn't just your mind that's under attack here, it's your body. As you feel that agonizing spike of pain in your stomach, you can't move an inch. The pain doubles you over. It's some of the worst agony you've ever felt, even in the deepest abysses of the back rooms. You feel a hot surge climbing up your throat and vomit before you can even think to hold it back. It reminds you of the first time you had stomach flu for a hellish week back in sixth grade, but times by 10. You look down at the puke on the floor. Does it look oddly red to you? The paranoia strikes again. Are your organs rotting away from the inside somehow? Just like the food in the bauble. Does this terrible place just cause everything to decay? The orange glow, 
You need it now more than ever. Perhaps it will heal you, fix you from the inside and out. Yes, that must be why it's here. To aid frightened explorers like you in your time of need, you need to push through the pain, no matter how terrible it feels. It'll all be worth it in the end. You continue hobbling across the creaky floorboards. The orange glow is in sight now. You feel shadows lurking all around you, reaching out with long, spindly fingers, watching with invisible eyes. Your eyelids are heavy. You suddenly feel the most tremendous sense of lightheadedness. Your forehead is glazed with a fine film of cold sweat. Are you blacking out? No, you can't. Not now. Who knows what would happen if you fell asleep here? You need to get back to the safety of the glow. It's the only way. But when you reach the floorboards with the orange glow rising up between them, to your horror, you don't feel the calm and serenity you felt earlier. Only that terrible dread and pain, getting worse and worse. Naturally, panic starts to set in. This can't be possible. You needed this. What are you going to do now? You press your face up against the floorboards, but still, you feel nothing. You rise to your feet in a state of pure terror. Then it hits you, the idea that might save your life. What if all you need to do is get closer to that orange glow? And the only way you can do that is by breaking these damn floorboards. So that's exactly what you do. Summoning all of your remaining strength and animal fury, you stomp on the planks below again and again, feeling shockwaves of pain shooting up your leg each time. But you don't stop. You don't give up. You just keep stomping and stomping and stomping until you hear the wood start to crack and splinter. The floor gives way beneath you and you fall, but not into the orange glow. You just so happen to find a direct route to level 20. And all it took was a little attic vandalism. Who knew? You got lucky this time, Explorer. Next time, it won't be so easy. Want to stay tuned for the next exciting exploration into the back rooms as we delve deeper and deeper into this liminal abyss. Be sure to subscribe to The Back Rooms Explained and turn on notifications so you never miss another expedition. Now go check out Level 20, Warehouse, for more exercises into Back Rooms Terror.